The MSI GP75 Leopard is a gaming laptop with some powerful specs inside, and definitely punching above its weight in gaming performance. So let's check it out in this detailed review and help you decide if it's a laptop you should consider. I've got the 9SF model, so we've got an Intel i7-9750H CPU, NVIDIA RTX 2070 graphics, no Max-Q here, and 16GB of memory running in dual channel. For storage, there's a 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD and a 17.3 inch 1080p 144Hz IPS level screen. For network connectivity, it's got Gigabit Ethernet, 802.11 AC Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5. There are a few different configurations available though, you can find examples and updated prices linked in the description. The lid of the laptop is a matte black, while the interior is this sort of silver plastic, which I liked over MSI's usual all black colour scheme. All edges and corners were rounded, no sharp spots anywhere, and the build quality seemed good for a primarily plastic machine. The weight is listed at 2.6 kilos on the MSI website, and mine came in under this. With the large 280 watt power brick and cables for charging included, the total weight rises by over a kilo. The dimensions of the laptop are 39.7cm in width, 26.8cm in depth, and 2.9cm high, so a little thicker than other machines I've tested recently, which hopefully means improved cooling. The screen bezels look very thin. At first glance, I thought I was actually looking at a 15 inch machine, and I measured them at about 8mm on the sides. The 17.3 inch 1080p 144Hz IPS screen has a matte finish, acceptable viewing angles, though no G-Sync. I've measured the colour gamut using the Spider 5 Pro, and my results returned 96% of sRGB and 73% of Adobe RGB. At 100% brightness in the centre, I measured 301 nits with a 820 to 1 contrast ratio. So decent results for a gaming laptop, and much nicer than the TN panels MSI were often using in older models. Backlight bleed wasn't ideal, the patches down the bottom left and right corners were occasionally noticeable while viewing darker content, but this will vary between laptop and panel. There was a bit of screen flex, honestly not bad considering that the lid is on the thinner side, the hinges being out towards the corners helped with stability and they felt quite sturdy. It wasn't possible to open it up with one finger, demonstrating more weight is distributed towards the back, as both the heat pipes and battery are found there, though no issues sitting it on my lap. Despite the top screen bezel being on the thinner side, MSI was still able to fit the camera and microphone here. The camera looks pretty average and the audio sounds decent. The keyboard has per-key RGB lighting which even lights up secondary functions on all keys. I've said it before, but I think MSI have one of the nicest looking RGB keyboards. It will of course come down to personal preference, but the lighting is bright and can be seen on the edges of the keys. The keyboard worked well and I liked typing with it. Here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. There are some additional buttons on the top right below the power button, including a shortcut to cycle through keyboard lighting effects, and a button to enable cooler boost mode, which sets the fan speed to maximum. Both of these can be done through the software, but I found it nice to have a dedicated button available, which makes it easy to change while in a game for example. There was a little keyboard flex, nothing too bad, but it depends on where you push it, no issues during normal use though. The touchpad has precision drivers, was smooth to the touch and worked well. The touchpad itself does not click down, however there are separate left and right click buttons below it, which are very tactile feeling and give an audible click. Fingerprints were harder to see on the interior due to the silver colour, however they would show up with the slightest touch on the black metal lid and were also harder to wipe off there. On the left, there's loads of I.O. From the back, there's a Kensington lock, air exhaust vent, gigabit ethernet port, HDMI 2.0 and mini display port outputs, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A port and Type-C port, no Thunderbolt though, and 3.5mm headphone and mic jacks. On the right, there's a full-size SD card slot, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, air exhaust vent and power input right at the back. On the back, there are just air exhaust vents towards the corners and leopard text in the centre. While on the front, there's just some status LEDs in the middle. The matte black metal lid looked really nice in my opinion. It's got more of a subtle design compared to many of MSI's previous models. The logo in the centre lights up white from the backlight of the screen so cannot be controlled. Underneath, there are some air intake vents directly above the two fans at the back, as well as some other random vents closer to the front. The two 3 watt speakers are found towards the front left and right corners. They sound alright, though a bit tinny sounding. And they get very loud. Here's what we're looking at with maximum volume while playing music. And the latency mod results didn't look great. 
The bottom panel can be removed by taking out 13 screws with a Phillips head screwdriver, and the two at the back corners are shorter than the rest. Once inside from left to right, there's a 2.5 inch drive bay, Wi-Fi card, two memory slots, and two M.2 slots. One supports both PCIe and SATA, while the other is PCIe only, while the battery is found right up the back. Powering the laptop is that 6 cell 51 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled, and all RGB lighting off. While streaming YouTube videos, I was only seeing 3 hours and 38 minutes. Not a great result, and that's with the Intel integrated graphics due to Nvidia Optimus. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the battery lasted for 59 minutes. Again, lower than usual, but at least it maintained 30 FPS the entire time. The 280 watt power brick that MSI include with the laptop honestly seems to be overkill for these specs. I never saw any battery drain during any of my testing. Let's move on to the thermal testing. Just for a recap on the cooling design, air comes in through the bottom and is exhausted out the two vents on the back corners and side vents on both the left and right. Inside we've got seven heat pipes in total, with one of these shared between the CPU and GPU. The MSI Dragon Center software allows you to customize fan speed. I've tested with the fans either at automatic speed or with cooler boost mode enabled, which basically sets the fan speed to maximum. I've also tested with turbo mode enabled, which overclocks the GPU by 100MHz on the core and 200MHz on the memory. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 22 degrees Celsius, so expect different results in different environments. I've tested idle down the bottom and the results were about normal. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads, and are meant to represent worst case scenarios as I ran them for extended periods of time. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. The stress test results shown on the lower half of the graph are from running the A64 CPU stress test, with only the stress CPU option checked, and the Heaven GPU benchmark at max settings at the same time to fully load the system. So kind of a worst case scenario. Starting at the bottom with the stress tests running and fans in auto mode, we're seeing the hottest temperatures. And while power limit throttling was hit on the CPU, intermittent thermal throttling was happening. By enabling cooler boost to max out the fans, we're able to lower the temperatures slightly. Undervolting the CPU didn't really change the temperatures. And when combined with the cooling pad, they dropped down just a couple of degrees on the CPU. Similar results with the gaming tests, though in this particular game, thermal throttling wasn't being reached. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. As the main limit with the stress tests running was the power limitation of 45 watts, we're not seeing any change in the stress test by boosting fan speed. It's the undervolt to the CPU that improves performance the most, allowing us to hit the full 4GHz all-core turbo boost speed of the i7-9750H. These are the average TDP values reported by Hardware Info during these same tests. Basically, nothing really changes until we undervolt the CPU. It lowers a bit below the 45 watt limit as power limit throttling is only just removed. And then there appears to be less of a requirement for CPU power in the game tests, as identified by the lower TDP values there. Here's what we're looking at with CPU only performance using Cinebench. With the turbo mode, the 9750H was around other laptops I've tested. Most seem to be around the 2800 market stock. However, once undervolted, we were able to achieve an 11% higher score. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was quite cool, at the usual 30 degree average. With the stress tests going and fan at auto speed, the keyboard gets to the mid 40s, so warm to the touch, but not really a problem. While gaming with the fan at max speed, it's perhaps a little cooler, though quite similar. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle, the fans were usually silent, however it would ramp up just slightly at times. With the stress test running and fans on automatic, the noise level is fairly average compared to many other gaming laptops I've tested, while the fan set to maximum with cooler boost mode is a bit louder. Overall, the GP75 with these specs is running on the warmer side in these tests. However, as we're about to see, this is probably fair considering the high levels of performance the specs are able to provide us. Next, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. I've tested with turbo mode enabled, which does overclock the graphics, and with cooler boost mode enabled, so maximum fan speed. The Division 2 was tested using the built-in benchmark, and this game is a recent addition for me. 
From what I've seen so far, Ultra Settings always seems to have much lower 1% low results compared to average FPS. Despite this, the averages at Ultra and High were noticeably better over the other lower powered machines tested in this game. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode, and the results here were very good, as we'll see later when we compare against some other laptops. Even RTX was playing okay at higher settings, just below a 60 FPS average with high settings. Though if you want best performance with decent looks, leaving RTX off and just using Ultra is the way to go. Apex Legends was tested with either all settings at maximum or all settings at the lowest possible values, as it doesn't have predefined setting presets. It was playing very well. I seemed to test in a more demanding area, because even lower spec machines will hit the 144 FPS cap at times in different areas. So these are great results where I test. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with a built-in benchmark, and the results here are again quite good, though a bit lower at lower settings compared to even lower spec machines, which seems to indicate possibly lower CPU power in games while the powerful GPU holds it up at higher settings. Far Cry New Dawn was tested with a built-in benchmark, this game seems to be fairly CPU heavy, and while we're not seeing much higher results compared to other lower spec laptops, the extra GPU power does help more at higher settings. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and at max settings it was working extremely well, easily surpassing 100 FPS for the 1% low at max settings in my test. Absolutely no issues at all in this less demanding game. Overwatch is another well-optimized game and was tested in the practice range. Again, extremely nice frame rates for a laptop are being seen here, with almost 200 FPS at max settings, while low was reaching the 300 frame cap. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and again pretty good results, above average over most other laptops given the specs, though not really by much considering how much extra GPU power there is, as this is more of a CPU driven test. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built-in benchmark, even with maximum ultra settings, we're getting well above 100 FPS for the 1% low on a 100% render scale, so great performance once more. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was tested with the built-in benchmark, and as a CPU heavy test, the results at lower settings aren't too different from many other machines. However, the extra GPU power does put it in front at higher levels. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane with an average amount of action going on, and was playing quite well even with ultra settings with very high frame rates and no issues that I could notice. Watch Dogs 2 uses a lot of resources, though the results were still pretty good here. With above 60 FPS averages at ultra settings, it was playing perfectly fine maxed out. The Witcher 3 was also playing well at ultra settings, and I found this one to work favorably with more GPU power, which was also the case here. Even ultra settings was running above 100 FPS and playing great. If you're after more gaming benchmarks, check the card in the top right corner where I've tested 20 games in total. Let's also take a look at how this config of the MSI GP75 compares with other laptops to see how it stacks up. Use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. In Battlefield 5, I've got the GP75 highlighted in red near similarly specced machines. It's performing quite well in this game, actually coming out in first place in terms of average FPS out of these specific laptops shown. So basically beating 2080 Max Q machines with G-Sync. The 1% low isn't quite as impressive, though it's still up there. These are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built-in benchmark. Again, we're seeing great results here, with the GP75 coming in at third place. It's behind the Razer Blade Pro 17 with Max Q 2070, but keep in mind it's running with a much higher than normal power limit for the GPU, is also overclocked, but also has the CPU undervolted by default. Otherwise the 1% low was in second place out of all machines, and still outperforming MSI's GS75 with 2080 Max-Q. These are the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the built-in benchmark at highest settings. Once more, very good results here, with the GP75 clearly ahead of the other two 2070 machines I've tested below it, the ASUS SCAR 3 and Aorus 15. This time it's performing equally to the Blade Pro, but not quite able to keep up with the 2080 Max-Q machines. Overall, the GP75 is performing very well here. The full RTX 2070 is performing a fair bit better than the other two 2070 laptops I've tested, and the only difference I can really pinpoint is that MSI are overclocking the GPU with turbo mode, which is clearly helping. I've also got the results from 3D Mark's Firestrike, Time Spy, Port Royal, and VR Mark. Overall, good results again, especially in the graphics score thanks to the overclocked 2070. As we saw earlier, we've got the option of undervolting the CPU to improve performance, so let's see how this actually does in games. I've tested Far Cry 5 with the built-in benchmark at 1080p. Basically, there's no real difference, at least in this specific title. 
Results were mostly within margin of error in terms of average FPS at low, normal, and high settings, with what appears to be a slightly higher improvement at Ultra. I admit this surprised me a little considering the lower results at lower settings mentioned earlier, which would appear to be due to the CPU performance, but undervolting didn't seem to help. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the storage, and the 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD was performing quite well, while the SD card wasn't doing too well with my V90 card, though still better than not having one at all. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, in the US I could only find the 9SD model with the 1660 Ti for around 1500 US dollars. I'm not too sure of the specs available around the world, however this model is available here in Australia for 4000 Australian dollars. For my international viewers, once you remove our tax and convert the currency, that's around 2500 US dollars. However tech in general does cost more here compared to the US, which is not being factored in, so it would be less than this rough guess. With all of that information in mind, let's review the good and bad aspects of this machine. Overall, I personally like the design. The metal lid and silver interior are more subtle compared to previous MSI designs, though the plastic interior did flex while pushing it in some areas, though this wasn't a problem practically. The thin screen bezel was great. At first I honestly thought I was looking at a 15 inch machine, as it's smaller than many 17 inch models I've used, though the backlight bleed in my unit was unfortunate, however that will always vary between units. The battery life was quite poor compared to many other machines I've tested, and it can run on the warmer side while under high levels of load. This seems to be due to the high end specs we've got inside though, so we are able to get very high levels of performance in games out of the RTX 2070. The keyboard and touchpad worked well. I personally thought the lighting looked good and has a lot of different effects. There's a good selection of IO, most of which is on the left and away from your mouse hand if you're right handed, and having a dedicated button to quickly boost fan speed was nice to have. Given the performance is above other similarly specced machines I've tested, it'll be interesting to see how the price stacks up in the US compared to those. Let me know what you thought about MSI's GP75 Leopard 9SF gaming laptop down in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, consider getting subscribed for future laptop reviews and tech videos like this one.